All right, I am finally introing this interview I've had for a long time. This was my second interview. It was for the actual Catholic Clutch. This whole idea actually came from this person right here. Her name is Jess, and uh, she runs the shop. She runs the whole place, and she's been running it since 2014. Um, yeah, the audio is totally messed up. Totally messed up. So, please excuse the audio. I'm going to try and doctor it as best as I can, but uh, the audio sucks, so let's go inside. Okay, hello everybody. You probably don't see me with this lighting, and that's totally fine. I'm a silhouette. My name. Yes. <laughs> My name is John, and I'm here with Jess, the owner of. Ooh, look at those levels. I am popping like crazy. Um, my name is John, and I am here with Jess, who is the owner of Cafe Clutch, the whole project. That came out in 2014, I believe. And I really want you to tell everybody where you got the idea of Cafe Clutch. Like the German theme idea. Like what was the initial part of that? All right. So Cafe Clutch is a German word. German words are very... A closer. Oh, Cafe Clutch is a German word. That means... Coffee had a long. Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So this close? Yeah, 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 yeah. There Should we go. Should I be like? I don't know what to do. <laughs> as long as it's like. Here. Yeah, like so it has to be like thumb distance. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, hopefully you can edit out yeah. all my missings. Um. So Cafe Clutch is uh. Okay. I chose Café Clutch because it's a very beautiful German word. Uh, it's also a, a Yiddish word, and I have a Jewish background. The word means social conversation had over coffee. And it's German words are usually quite specific, so it's when uh, a bunch of people get together, usually in the afternoon, usually um, a group of elderly ladies, and uh, they gossip over coffee. The Clatch was an actual newspaper rag that people would read, uh, and it was like a gossip rag. Uh, so that's a very beautiful way of um, hinting at how people should enjoy coffee. Um, so the idea was that uh, coffee will spark social conversation, and with each coffee um, comes an invitation to chat. Okay. I have like so many questions for this. I like prepped this like I swear a month in advance. <laughs> when and why did you start a coffee shop? Like why coffee? <laughs> um, so the beginning uh, was probably 20, 2014. Yeah. Uh, I was working out of Community Wise, which is a nonprofit uh, organization that supports other nonprofits. I was the director of the Calgary Society of Independent Filmmakers. Uh, my contract was ending, and I needed to, needed to sidestep into something else. Um, and that space in particular wanted something to to activate it during the day and they wanted some kind of social connector and that was clearly a coffee shop to me. Uh, I was offered a very small 25 square foot storage closet and that was perfect for me because I wanted to create a mobile car that traveled around to spark social connections, social conversations 
So the very beginning night was um, we launched the mobile truck. It's not really a truck, cart. Um, at Nui Blanche, which was a biannual art festival at the time, and then it was sort of housed in community-wise, and I operated out of that 25 square foot storage space, and really sort of fell in love um, with, I was already in love with drinking coffee, but I fell in love with making coffee around that time, and built it out from there. Um... I, want, I really want to get into David Bowie. I don't know why. Well, actually, I do know why, and you know why. But we're not going to get into that yet. I have to say one thing. Explain the choice of coffee beans that you chose, and explain that trip you had <laughs> when you went and tried coffee in... Was it Mexico? Where was it? Oh, yeah, I went Mexico. So it was like Me- it was like a whole Mexican trip that Jess went to. I know the whole backstory because me and Jess talked about it. Obviously, I'm employed here at Cafe Clutch, but I would love for everybody to know that story and where it came from. All your choices. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I know this story. <laughs> so what was the first the my so I'll talk about Mexico and then I'll double back and talk about beans. Yeah. In general. So okay. uh, I went to Mexico City with my sister, and um, when I go to cities, new cities, I always make a list of coffee shops that I want to visit. Yeah. And I um, was lucky enough to meet up with the uh, Aeropress champion of Mexico, and he took me to ten different coffee shops. Yeah. In a day, I <laughs> <laughs> and I had at least a drink in each one. Oh my god. Um, that was intense, and I really shouldn't have done all of that so quickly, but um, how often do you get a chance to meet up with a champion barista? Mm-hmm. Not often, um, but I don't even think that was the story you wanted. What I think you wanted was the... The choice of the beans. I- the idea that uh, Mexican coffee has always been considered not the tastiest, it's never had a good reputation. You are usually drinking a Colombian or a Guatemalan. And I didn't really understand why until I went to Mexico and realized that all of the good coffee in Mexico actually doesn't get exported out. Mm-hmm. It remains in Mexico. And the coffee there is phenomenal, but the coffee that we taste is not quite the same. <laughs> yeah. Was that... What you? <laughs> well, because you have a specific, like, you, your choices in coffee is very specific. So that's, like, where you got the coffee from is kind of what I was kind of going at. Or where did these ideas come from and why why you choose the coffee you choose here? So. Yeah, so I'm fortunate to work with some really good roasters who um, also understand that coffee is is a delicious fruit and also um, the whole process from the farming to the um, the delivery to the roasting to the burst of preparation is, is, is all sort of like many art forms in a way and so we chose roasters like quietly coffee and rooftop coffee roasters um, and others that we worked with in the past that, that we do highlight the um, inherent attributes that are sort of contained within the bean um, and that's sort of like the terroir ca- characteristics that you that you get out of like wine. Awesome. Yes, that is what I wanted. I wanted to know everything about where you got your coffee from. Um, I know there's a connection to David Bowie here because we've talked about this before, and I want people to know this connection. I want, like, the ins and outs of, like, Cafe Clutch, like the David Bowie connection. Also, I'm going to get you to go this side, okay. with this side. So doing it the wrong way. Through. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, uh, German uh, words are interesting. German culture is is interesting. The German uh, coffee house culture is, is, is fabulous. If you think of, like, the Viennese coffee houses of the past um 
But also, David Bowie was in Berlin, and during that time, he really soaked up the flavor. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time there, and he also came out with his trilogy se- series, which was probably the one of the more remarkable. Um, yeah, because David Bowie sort of went outside of himself and produced music that it that was of that time and specifically of of like the almost like the German techno scene yeah. that was like developing there um, and that's remarkable coming from like a glam rock and roll artist uh, also he was working with Iggy Pop at the time and I believe he was trying to detox but I don't think that went over very well <laughs> Uh, so we do have uh, nods to David Bowie's time in Berlin. We have the, the low record um, within this space. And when I built out the space, I really wanted to have that um, classic German coffee house vibe that is present currently, but also was, was present around the time that, that, that Bowie was in Berlin. I just, I needed people to know that. I, like, definitely need people to know that because I feel like it's interesting to see where, like, it kind of came from and it's kind of become this, not a weird queer space, but it has become, like, somewhat of a queer space. And... But it is a queer space. But it, what, sorry? It is a queer space. But it, like, before that you were just doing coffee and then this location in particular became like this queer space that is kind of awesome it has like a little book reading store it has artwork as well and also has the pantry like it has like a lot of elements to it that people don't really see so i'm trying to get like every single element as possible yeah Yeah. so i actually want to talk about the pantry how did that whole thing happen um so the the pantry is um, put together by an organization called The Hatch YYC, and um, they also have a couple other pantries and a community fridge um, as well, and they were inspired by a lot of the other um, mutual aid projects that are going around uh, Calgary, um, all of the other community fridges and pantries and organizations that are that are helping out, especially during this time of need. During, like, um, I mean, it, we've all needed help, but I think it was more highlighted during the pandemic. So uh, how this came about was um, I volunteered uh, with an organization. I'm so sorry, I can't remember the name, but the, the organization was uh, Let's Walk in Chinatown with people from that area mm-hmm. who are elderly and don't have a lot of social contact and need that um, especially in, in, in during the time of like the very early t- like the, the early days of the pandemic when um, there was a lot of Asian hate clearly yeah. um, so I joined in and walked around um, we went, went a nice walk. We went on a nice walk throughout Chinatown, and the girls from the Hatch were there, and I was introduced to them, and um, asked them to to do something similar. Uh, they were talking about doing this thing, and so I said, "Let's do it at Cafe Clash," and we've been workshopping it um, uh, throughout the summer, and then it was like launched, I think, in the fall, like the. When was it launched? The fall of the winter? Something like that. <laughs> I think it was the fall because I remember it just appeared at my first show and you were like, hey, look at this. <laughs> so. Before it got real cold. Yeah. So it must be fall. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes, yes. It was like around that time when it came to be. You also have. Sorry, we didn't have the logistics to do the fridge, so it's a pantry. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. So we wanted to do a fridge, but it became a pantry. There's also the queer 
lending library, and I already talked to Liam about this, but how did this come to be <laughs> from your perspective? Um, L- Liam has, say, how do I say this? So when, when I started Cafe Clutch ages ago, when I had my coffee bike and my small mobile set up, Liam helped me out quite a bit. He was just always around and always helpful. And of course I'm going to give back to people who gave so much of their time and energy when I had such a tiny space. Uh, so this was Liam's, um, and like a Liam, this was Liam's idea initially. Um, and it sounded fabulous. I'm clearly a book lover. We already have the partnership within the space with Shelf Life Books. Uh, I've, already, I've popped up in the past in Shelf Life Books and I knew that the cafe needed uh, books within it. Uh, so it's nice to have the option to purchase, but then also an option to read in the space. And then it just like felt better to also allow people to take it out as well, read it at their own leisure, and then bring it back whenever they needed. And I enjoy the fact that I had certain ideas about what I wanted the space to be, but others did as well, and, and others added and to the beauty that that is Cafe Clutch. Okay. And it's not just Liam. Um, I'm going to get to beer right after that because I know you're also a beer connoisseur. <laughs> I just love to drink beer. Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying that's, that's one thing that you love to do. But there is also the... Oh my god, I need to talk about this so badly. And it just left my mind. <laughs> So, we were talking about, good thing I have this to guide, right? So, that's what I wanted to talk about. So, your art background, how long did that came to be? And tell us more about the art installments that you actually have at this venue. <laughs> um... So I graduated Egghead back in 2005. I have a BFA with a major in drawing. Uh, Then went on to do art administration for um, probably a decade, uh, working in most of the artist run centers here in Calgary. Um, Majority of my time was spent at the New Gallery, which is currently in Chinatown. And... uh, yeah, there ended up, it, it, I, I guess, uh, somehow, um, I never gave up my love for art, and so there's still art all over this place, um, in, the ter- in, the, in both objects, um, uh, permanent art collections, and then also, um, I've wrote, we've done about, well, we're going to install our eighth um, exhibiting artist, so each of the artists um, have had a two-month uh, slot, and um, the first one was a collaboration with Burnto Studios, and I wanted to, um, I mean, most cafes exhibit uh, art, have art on the walls and, and do sell art, um, but I really want to focus in on um, the work that I thought was high quality, um, but also uh, work by underrepresented artists, um, having at one point known the art world quite well. I, I, I saw that there were some gaps and some, some people were, were clearly overlooked, uh, and so I wanted to, to give people that opportunity um, to, to exhibit and sell work within the space. Uh, most of the artists that have exhibited with us have have sold quite a bit, um, but with each show, uh, they've also uh, they've also sort of brought a smaller and more affordable um, objects that they would sell as well. So we've had postcards and greeting cards and um, little 
little wonderful desert rose sculptures and um, things that are very, at a very low price point, like under $30. Um, and I thought that created a lot of uh, value because it meant that art was accessible, um, not just in the sense that you can come and view it, but uh, you could also uh, quite easily uh, afford something if you couldn't afford the, the, the larger, more expensive piece. So, um, on that note, I know you sell art, and I know you sell tote bags, and I know you sell chocolate. And I know, like, I just know everything you sell because I work here, obviously, but I'm just saying, like, tell everybody what you sell here because obviously it's unique, not just with the, not just with the artwork, but, like, just every single thing who you work with with the chocolate and even, like, the, co it's so specific who, like, all the stuff you sell. I know it's, it doesn't sound specific, but to me, it's like, this is good stuff. Like, it's not just quantity and it's not just cheap it's like literal like the people you work with so I would love to know all that stuff too you can start with the chocolate <laughs> oh yeah the chocolate that's Goldie from like last my friend Amy she was also an art student so of course I'm going to give a nod back to her um it also, like, I mean, I sell, like, retail gear, retail coffee gear from, from, from Maydown's Coffee. Um, I sell coffee bags, <laughs> like, the, the typical things that you would see in a, in a coffee shop, as, long, like, as well as, like, some swag that says Cafe Clutch on it. I think that's pretty normal. Um, but I also, we do have uh, some work by uh, local artists as well, so some some books some stickers some just um random paraphernalia that uh, either i've inherited somehow or i've collected or people have offered to um exhibit their their work and uh, most of the people that i have currently has just been people that i've interacted with in 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 the past um I mean, some some baristas as well, so we have some stuff by uh, Cynic, um, and uh, we have some poetry by by Nikki Reimer, and and also some by Laurie Lafleur, who is a uh, previous uh, imp who was an employee um, in the very beginning um, when we opened the storefront space. Yeah. There's also, I really want to talk about the setup of this place, because it is very specific, too. <laughs> um, what was your idea when you, like, especially this location? I know you have two locations. You have one in the, the, the one near the hospital. Yeah. The, what was it, Foothills Hospital? or? I always confuse the two, but <laughs> <laughs> it's one of... It's, it's, it's in the, the Cambridge on the center. Yeah. The other space is the Cambrian Wellness Center, which is uh, a private medical clinic home to EFW Radiology and um, a couple of other places. And it's also the place that CBC, our uh, national broadcaster, moved into. The, yeah, the, Cal or Calgar the Calgary CBC. Um, that wasn't, I <laughs> never remember your questions, but that wasn't even the question. Um, so, the question was, is uh, your art installation, um, what, this space in particular, what, what was the idea of the design? Because it's so, it's, first of all, it's clean and it's so spacious, but everything looks particularly, like, it's supposed to be there, but, like, looks, it should be there. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just describing it myself. But. <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, this, this space was previously home to Tokyo Smoke, who did most of the, the renovations, and they did a, a fabulous job. I, this is something that I would have done with the space had I had the, the money to do so. So, when I came across it, I was very in love and very enamored with it. Uh, then the design aesthetic um, was 
this very particular German style called it's got German functionalism so it's so it is uh, like following like a little bit of like the Adolf Luce like uh, d like ornament is a crime let's keep it kind of minimal and simple but also functional and practical uh, so it's like a very uh, specific style that I wanted to kind of uh, uh, evoke I wanted it to be um, be beautiful and res res like like uh, simple black and white uh, restrained palette um, very um, timely fur furnish furnishings so that it would it would look good years from now um, not anything too flashy and then I knew I wanted to also make it a space that people felt comfortable walking into if they they weren't like into design <laughs> I didn't want it to be too perfectly designed. I wanted it to have uh, some punk rock elements and um, some homey elements and those kinds of things. So we've got lots of plants here, <laughs> which is actually um, uh, Alyssa Ellis, who's a plant performance artist. This is a piece called Plant Foster. This is... Uh, plants that have been abandoned that has been retrieved by her and they're named by the person who gave her the plant and the area that the plant was from. Um, so when did you start deciding to do events? Like when did that come about? Because that wasn't there when you first started. It just kind of like slowly blossomed into that. Was that the plan or was that just like Maybe I should start doing events. Like, how did it come to be? <laughs> well, first we had beer. <laughs> yeah, we did. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, when I got licensed, then um, it was kind of a natural progression because this space was home to the ballroom, right, of the Drum and Monkey. The Bamp. The oh, so I always call it the bamboo ballroom it's it's the bamboo oh my yeah. god i feel ba bad it's the <laughs> I really need to get rid of that because it's like <laughs> this is a bamboo um so of course the space needed music it, like it screamed to have events in the like djs happen djs again in the windows and bands in it and and to kind of bring back a little bit of um to, to, to give a nod back to, to what the space was um, and it was a space that I I didn't frequent as much as I frequented like the drum I was at dub of the pub a lot I didn't really dance too much but I still wanted to sort of like it felt like it it felt like it needed that and then um, I mean, I and everyone I think that we've hired, we're all music nerds, so, so why not? <laughs> yes, like, yeah, I used to go to the Drum and Monkey. I actually know the old DJ, John Delirious, and may or may not be booking him sometime soon, yeah, just to, like, give a, like, a nod to, like, the, a real, real nod, nod. Yeah. yeah, to like the whole drum and bass experience, or not drum and bass, the drum and monkey experience that we all loved. Most Calgary people know about drum and monkey. It was such a, to me, a legendary bar. It was like the first tiki bar in Calgary. I'll, I'll repeat that because we didn't have the mic on that, but like, oh. it was the first tiki bar in Calgary. <laughs> 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 it's all good. Um... I also wanted to talk about one more thing. So, we do have to talk... Oops, sorry. We do have to talk about this, just because the time of when you opened this was during the height <laughs> of the pandemic. Yeah. And we need to, like... It's not that we... I just want you to tell people how easy or hard it is to open an event or in a space like this, especially during the time like a pandemic, and what are things that you've tried that have actually worked during this time? 
All right, well, I'm going to back up and say that without the pandemic, I would not be able to have a space as beautiful as this. Um, so the pandemic created a, a scenario where there was a, a space that was already built out as a cafe mm -hmm. that was vacant, that rent could be negotiated down because it was unattractive to open a restaurant at, at what what now feels like the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I wasn't trying to hustle. I wasn't trying to like expand out my business. In fact, I like sh shut down my my other space. I brought my espresso machine home, and I I had was selling coffee to my apartment residents. <laughs> but um, but uh, I walked by the space, and I and I didn't want to give it up. Uh, and I and and I and Justin Trudeau who gave that magic loan uh, of of sixty thousand dollars. So for the first time in a, in a long time, I had, and probably the first time ever, I had um, access to, well, no no interest loan, which was amazing. Uh, so I had the startup, I had the the funds to start this, uh, and I knew that the pandemic would cause a barrier and would be difficult. But I thought to myself, oh, I have two years. It's not going to be a pandemic during the entire <laughs> the least. I'm not joking. I thought the exact same. So, uh, so it was it was probably more challenging than I kind of expected, um, especially with the, like the roller coasters of like restrictions, restrictions and easements, and then. Also, um, I stubbornly followed my own personal moral code and I've kept most of the restrictions in place and I've kept the social distancing and um, tried to make sure this space was as safe as possible while still needing to operate within it. Um, so yes, it's been, it's been challenging. Was that actually, I forgot about that. I think there's something that people don't really do as much as we've kind of done here at Cafe Clutch. Can you explain the CO2 detector? Because that's a, but for real, for real, that's a, that's a thing that we were trying to figure out a way to solve the problem of like the mass mandates just being dropped, and we wanted to protect people still in some sort of way without having them, you know, without having them feel like they had to do what they had to do. So explain the CO2 detector to most businesses. So maybe that that, that could be a interest for some businesses. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, how do, how do we keep people safe when um, there's no vaccine passports or masking mandates? Uh, well, COVID is airborne, so the one thing you can do is control the air quality. And that is um, usually ex expensive fil filters. Um, but what you, can't, what, you, what you can do that's more, much more affordable, and this is in the, the, about the $400 price point, um, is buy li like a small um, CO2 detector. I think we got ours from like it's called like Rnet, um, Rnet Four, something fancy like that. Um, so what it is is, and I, I'm gonna like simplify this, and and it's pro and probably get it wrong because I'm not like sciencey, but but it detects the amount of CO2 in the air, and so we're breathing and exhaling CO2. So if there's a lot of CO2 in the air, then that means essentially it gets it gets more and more dangerous because we're breathing in the CO2. So we're breathing in other people's air. And and the one thing we don't want to do <laughs> is um, accidentally bring in a, a bad patch of air or however that, that, that goes. So so like the the least amount 
of other people's air that we breathe in, the better. Um, but but what it's nice about it is like it's a very practical thing that shows you, oh, we're in a danger zone, and all we need to do is open a door and wait 15 minutes, and we will no longer be in that danger zone. So we can feel like we can we can keep everyone safe while still like having fun dancing with the DJ. Um, and we've had a couple events and we have monitored this and it does seem very effective and also the dancers seem to enjoy it because it is hot and the cool air <laughs> is nice and, um, and it hasn't seemed that obtrusive so, so this is like the, um, the uh, probably the measure that everyone can get behind <laughs> I think one of the biggest keys just just in case this isn't like a fake news type of thing, who gave you this information to get the CO2 detector? And I know you bought it beforehand, but who was the person that told you about the CO2 detector? I reached out to a doctor on Twitter. <laughs> and, and he said, get this thing, so I got this thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to figure out the doctor's name so I can, like, we can shout him out. Uh, Vipon. Vipon? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, like, it wasn't just like we got a CO2 detector because, like, oh, it's airborne. It's like we actually, well, Cafe Clutch actually did the research and tried to figure out a way to protect people as much as possible. <laughs> and. And like maybe maybe it's wrong, but at least we're trying to do these random things to protect people from the pandemic because we want it to be a safe space. That's like one of the biggest things. Um, another thing that I really wanted to talk about. I have to get this done. I hate how this keeps closing. Um, I got to talk about the food, and I got to talk about beer still. So let's get onto the beer topic because we haven't. I, I was gonna get to it, but. I want to know who are the people you've worked with. I know I introduced you to one of the people we've worked with, but in terms of beer, what do you look for? Because I know, and I mean, you can also say how long you've been drinking beer and your habits and all that stuff, but like, <laughs> no, for real, like some people just want to know where it came from. What, what's like, what's your ideals of beer? Like what, what are the ones that you pick specifically? And I know you work with establishment. I don't know if you worked with establishment for this German themed beer, but Tell us about the German themed beers that you have here. Okay, so the establishment is is lovely. Uh, not only do they have German beers uh, that are delicious, uh, but they also have the very simple black and white aesthetic that I love. And so, and they also uh, do like work with artists and collaborate um, when they. Um, put to, together their barrel aged cash cast beers so they obviously were um, uh, a fantastic find um, they were quite I mean I think they were only a year old as well when I when I reached out to them uh, or when they reached out to me I don't even know how it happened but I'm glad that it happened and then Dandy um, was the first place I reached out to because I am uh, very close friends with uh, the owner's brother, <laughs> Ben Leo, and I also really enjoy um, the aesthetic and the, the, the thought behind uh, Dandy Beer. Uh, it was probably one of my first introductions to craft beer, in particular their sours, and I think their sours are still um, by far the best in the city. And um, we have been since the very beginning, like doing five dollar beers on tap by Dandy. It's always been Dandy on t on tap, mostly establishment and cans. Um, but we've also worked with uh, Old Beautiful and now Exhale and um, hopefully a few other of the good ones because there's so many good ones in the, <laughs> in the city. <laughs> it's, 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 it's hard to go 
beyond Dandy and um, the establishment because they're, they're just so fa- fabulous and they have such a wide selection. Yeah, um, also, I'm going to ask this question. What? This is like just a weird question out of nowhere, but what was your like first favorite beer? Just to get like an idea of not what you based it on, but like what beer that you used to drink like all the time. I don't know if it was like a random beer or if you just were like just a casual beer drinker. Like, how did like what was like the one where you were like, this is what I call a beer? <laughs> oh no. Okay, so I love to experiment and I like to try new things, and so. I'm not really that person who will just drink one beer over and over and over again. Um, But since developing heartburn and I can't drink sours, I've been drinking like a lot of like dad beers. So I used to like drink the most like amazingly weird sounding flavorful beer. Um, But now I really just like a good saison, like a good lager, like the the establishment's pilsner. It's their Kolsch style beer. It's so so delicious. Those are the things that I've been kind of like zooming in on lately. I agree with those ones. Um, I've watched your food menu change, and I'm really happy about the new change. The old change was a. Uh, interesting because you had bagels on there and I totally get why it's just more practical it's easier to deal with I have a lot of German friends so they were like we don't sell bagels at this place and they got really mad but like it was like this is what we have here in in like Calgary is it the practical option is to sell a bagel or something like that but um, one of your staffs actually changed the menu into real open-faced German sandwiches, which is really awesome, and it's been improving ever since. Um, I actually want to explain two things. The first one... I am. I'm going to interview, like, everyone here. Like, I'm, I'm starting off with you and Liam, because I feel like that's, like, the most, but I want to go through, like, everyone here, including books, shelf life, and friggin' just everyone. Like, Cal especially. Um... But I wanna, I wanna emphasize like, where did you find your chef first and foremost? Um, the menu, obviously, you wanted to make it German themed. Obviously, you got your translation from one person. Like, explain all this, uh, all this stuff, and and explain what the German Breakfast Club was, because I think it's still a good idea. And explain what you wanted from that German Breakfast Club when you first started it. Okay, that's a lot. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, bagels are Jewish, and and it's it's still a nod yeah, <laughs> to yeah, yeah. Cafe Clutch. No, no, I'm not at me. That's all I'm saying. So we got mad at me. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, so the uh, orig- so the original bagel menu uh, was developed um, by James Dangerous uh, when a bagel shop opened, basically blocks away or like a short distance away from the Cambrian Wellness Center. So in our other location, we really did need food options that were simple, easy to prepare, and um, really uh, easy to, to, to digest. When I, when I surveyed what those people, uh, what people wanted in that space, uh, the responses were tuna salad, ham sandwich, this kind of stuff. So that's what we started with. And then when we opened this space, uh, we just used that menu almost as a placeholder because it is a lot of work to open a cafe. And uh, we just like were focusing on, on so many different aspects that we kind of abandoned the food aspect. Um, not entirely because we had uh, German soups and salads initially and then we also brought in food from the Allium but um, the bagel uh, options were were just there because uh, we didn't get around to, to fixing it we didn't get around to fixing it yeah. in, until um, 
Lauren, who is so amazing, uh, are well. She's a state student at at um, for pastries, but she's been making pastries probably her entire life, and she's already like she's definitely not a student. Um, she was first uh, approached me. She said she was interested in helping me bake, but she didn't have a, a place to bake. We we built out a small space in the back room for her, and and she started uh, producing German pastries for us, which was fabulous. Which is what I wanted: German style uh, baked goods and breads and stuff like this. Um, eventually, she developed our food menu, and that was a, a nice simple like open face sandwiches with this German rye bread called Wolkenbrot I'm probably saying that wrong uh, and we created um, the Stammermax which is like the classic German uh, breakfast sandwich uh, even though it's open faced uh, can you call it a sandwich? I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> it's still a thing. It's still a sandwich. Uh, not a... Okay. Um, so, we we created a, a, a more German food menu and got rid of our bagel menu and then also uh, thought through the idea of having like a more European continental breakfast uh, for the weekends and uh, Germans typically will go out on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday and have a slow almost like a brunch type meal where it's just a plate full of meat and cheese and yeah. some eggs maybe <laughs> but basically just meat <laughs> and, and and yeah and um and sauces and dips and stuff like that so like mustards and sauerkrauts and stuff like that so so i i did hire an artist friend of mine um and we sort of developed like the the sketch for the the german breakfast club and so we call that the dash food steg which i think just means the breakfast or something <laughs> And so you can get that, um, but only like um, between a short window on the weekends because it's, it's a bit labor in, in, intensive for the baristas, and um, we have a very skeletal s staff here. Yeah, um, I mean, I can say right now, as like just me and Lauren have known each other for a long time. She's very, very skilled in trying to make things convenient. So eventually, it's going to get way better, and I'm really excited. But the German Bexers Club is on halt for right now, just for everybody to know. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's it. We, you can get it still, but it's just like on hold, and it's very good stuff, very good meat. Just we we try to stick to the whole German theme as much as possible, so random German people don't attack me. <laughs> Yeah, and we're, we're like we're just trying our best, okay? Like we're not. I don't know. I'm just saying we're, we're just trying our best. That's like we can only do so much. But I had like oh let's see. I think one question I really want to talk about is I think I brought this to your attention, which is the all ages. Yeah, so let's talk about how this could be the only all ages venue. And. There is Broken City, yes, I'm sorry. There is Broken City, forgive me. But, I mean, there wasn't, like, we had. In Calgary, we had, like, this thing called Tubby Dog, for anyone who doesn't know. And Tubby Dog has been around for 20 years, and they recently stopped doing all ages shows, which was kind of. A little sad for especially the punk scene which embraces all ages and has been embracing it since the 2000s like talking with Liam been in the punk scene since 1998 as he told me <laughs> um, 
98. That's what Liam just told me. But those things are very important. Where especially, I'm I'm talking to my 14 year, year old self, who I couldn't see shows and all that stuff. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about. I don't know if you've ever been to all ages shows, like at Tubby Dog. I don't know. I don't know. But let's talk about it. Like, what's your What's your idea actually on events? Like, what kind of events did you like going to, and other than art? <laughs> All right, so exposing my age, Liam and I both went to punk rock shows around the same time. <laughs> so there was a thing called the Multicultural Center yeah. when I was young, and we could go, I don't remember when, probably a Saturday um, anyways we could go like once a week and we could uh, pay attention to some punk rock bands mm-hmm. mostly local bands um, but that uh, shaped my 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 knowledge and love of his love of, oh my goodness let's shape my love of music yeah, yeah. And, and love of uh, live acts and um, the the camaraderie and the the like I mean most of my friends were were, were yeah going going to punk rock punk rock shows um, that sort of uh, was a important piece of per, my personal history I guess um, so when the idea that and I think it, I think it wasn't really even. I think you had the idea, yeah. but but we were having shows, and what was really beautiful about the shows that we were having is there was a, a, a crowd that was drinking beer, and then a crowd that was drinking coffee, and then a crowd that was drinking like pop and teas, and 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 what was beautiful about it was that we had that mix. And it was easy for us to do because we were already a cafe that also, that was sort of like added on beer as, a, as opposed to um, a bar that doesn't really have any other... Like, they do have coffee um, and, and juice and pop, but not in the same way. Like, uh, so when you're sober attending a, a, a show in, in a bar, you're, you're drinking like orange juice <laughs> which, <laughs> which was really which was was, like it's really terrible when you really want actually want beer um, so so it so having an all ages show where where there are more drink options um, is, is, is pretty fabulous um, giving a nod back to my own um, uh, history of going to, to punk rock shows and, and to be, allow younger generations to experience the the beauty that was um, yeah the all ages scene in Calgary I think that's that's beautiful why not I also I got two more things to say and then I'm gonna wrap it up because we're almost at an hour um, it's all good uh, so also, you approached me to do Cocktail Clash way too, way long ago. Explain that whole concept of Cocktail Clash. And I, I know I know most of it because I've worked with you, but explain that. And obviously you have German-inspired cocktails, yes. which is really awesome. But explain to everybody what the idea of Cocktail Clash was in the beginning. <laughs> so Cocktail Clash was like our funny way of trying to promote the fact that we had alcohol (laughs) initially um but then we sort of made it like a thematic thing so like every saturday is cocktail clash so every saturday from 7 p.m on to about 10 or 11 10 (laughs) yeah so we have basically we have djs from 7 to 10 and that was uh, yeah, a fun uh, Saturday night activity. So the, the, the you know 
the actual cafe cl- cafe clutch coffee shop sort of flips and becomes uh, more of a bar and uh, we have highlighted uh, three sort of like very German, a uh, classic German uh, cocktails and then we've kind of put uh, a spin on some of them so one is the Rudersheimer which is um, Asphalt I'll, James will be able to pronounce these things <laughs> <laughs> Ashrod Uralt. I don't even know how to say it. Uralt. Ashrod Uralt. Anyway, we have a very special German brandy um, that we use in the in the Rudersheimer. You actually pour the brandy over top of a sugar cube, and then you light it on fire, and then you add coffee into that mixture. Uh, and then you whip, add whipped cream and chocolate shavings, and we put it in a classic, traditional Rudersheimer cup. <laughs> like the actual cup, if you actually Google it, it's the cup. <laughs> but the real cup. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then we we've highlighted uh, that German brandy in the Nischkoleska, Nischkoleska which is uh, uh, orange. Um, Sorry, uh, I'm bad at this. Orange no, no, that's it. I'm sorry. no, it's a lemon coin that has espresso and sugar, mm-hmm. and it's like a performative drink. I mean, all of the drinks are performative, but this one's the most performative, where you can like dip it in the brandy and then eat it, or you can just leave it in the brandy, or you can drink the brandy and then eat the lemon coin. It's so you can kind of play around with your food a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, <coughs> um, and we have a couple others. Those are the, the, those are the and redacted. then we have like um, red, redacted is wine. is the Agonquin uh, that you just can't you just can't call it a Agonquin. So we redacted it. Okay. Um, it was based on a hotel, but still. Um, so that is a classic. Um, uh, drink, but then we we have the um, Underberg, which is a digestif that you can float on top of the redacted. Mm-hmm. We also have malt wine. Oh, oh yeah. And the reason why we have malt wine it, is because <laughs> <laughs> so malt wine is Glühwein in yeah. in, in in German. And uh, we added that because we feature on our menu the Kinderpunsch, which is the kids' version of the Glühwein. Um, so we have two types of mulled wine. We have the adult version and the kids' the kids' version. Um, very popular in Germany around Christmas time. Uh, because uh, when it's cold, it, it, both drinks create that lovely warming feeling that you get after drinking it. That was what you wanted, right? Yes. Yeah. And then, oh yeah, and then we do do feature cocktails. One of our favorites is Robert Smith's lipstick, <laughs> which is actually the bra- a bramble, um, but uh, it looks like Robert Smith's lipstick because of the way we drizzle. Um, that uh, blackberry liqueur on top. I have one more question. I think it's like the most important one. Um, I think your approach to how you contact people is something to be championed of because a lot of people are like, I'll send my minion to get this person. But you've always been kind of like more direct and more like... I need to talk to this person right away. I really want them to play at my venue, kind of thing. Well, but that. No, 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 no. Not just that. Not just that. I, I'm talking about like. I, I, like I've seen you approach random people. Have been like, I just asked, or you've just like, gone to like, every single person, every single festival that I can think of. You've just approached them instead of been like. Hey, I could have got my coworkers to do it for me because blah 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 blah. How come you have that more of like 
of an approach to like your approach to business is very interesting, especially because I feel like you've let people be themselves. And a lot of businesses are like, this is my vision and I want my vision to be the way I want it to be. So where did that come from? Like that whole approach? Cause that's not, especially in Calgary, I've worked in so many businesses. That's not the approach. So where did that come from? I think uh, my background working in like artist run culture uh, made me more collaborative um, and interested in community um, and and uh, more aligned with the nonprofit sector perhaps than the for-profit sector. I don't have a background in business. I'm not out to make a lot of money. Uh, I just wanted something and I went after it long enough for it to happen. Um, but I think there's a point when, I mean, in, initially when Cafe Clash was just, just sort of me, it was really, I was the identity behind the brand. Uh, but at a certain point, you re you reach a certain point where you have to give up that, and you have to let other people change the vision and add to it, and and that actually creates a much richer experience mm -hmm. than than it just being like the vision of one person and everyone else having to like do that vision. Because not everyone's gonna understand that vision, and it, and and um, and this place is uh, more special because of all of the different people that have added to it. It's something outside of me, which is something that I really value and appreciate. Uh, so. So that might be a personality thing. And then um, artist run culture was like consensus, trust, democratic uh, organization like that operated with the board of directors and everything was done collaboratively. So, so I sort of like have, a, have that in like, I would like that. I appreciate and I value that way of working. So I, I guess that it, it seems normal to me and me going up to, to people being like, hey, friend, like, do you want to do this thing? <laughs> like, also just seems normal to me. <laughs> but, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, approached, I approached you because uh, your music was amazing, and, and, I, and I was really appreciative. And, 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 um, and then on a whim, I just you know, was like, hey, do you want to perform here? <laughs> and I think I've done that to other people too. And, and that's, yeah. And, and, and yeah, I guess, and now, I, now that I have you, I've kind of let you take over all of that too. But every once in a while, I think I still revert back to just like me just being like, hey, you're really great. Do you want to do something? <laughs> it, it just, I think what helps the most in that is that we can tell that you're invested in the artist because a lot of places are just like, we need a booking place, we need someone to book. And then they don't even know anything about the artist. They get pissed off. They don't even like check with the artist. They haven't listened to any of their music. They're just waiting for people to show up. They have no idea what the artist is about. So that's why I was appreciative of it and I'm sure other people are appreciative of it. But even more, it helps a lot of people curate what you would want the venue by you going being like I'm gonna reach out to this person and I'm personally gonna tell this message because I listen to this person and that's kind of why I was like I think that's like something very special and very unique in comparison to many venues I've played here in Calgary <laughs> many venues where they just want you to fill the room and I get why they're, th they're that desperate and they're used to the old model of getting someone really famous to show up and we make money off of that really famous person as opposed to 
there's people here that we could probably make money off of. We just need to create that community type of thing. So that's why I value that so much. But on that note, I, I do want to end this off by like you kind of giving out all the information, where to find it, what like what events we have and all that stuff so that like people know where to go. Like you're on Twitter, Instagram and all that stuff. People need to know these things. I know it's weird, but they do need to know where you're at. <laughs> yeah. So the the storefront uh, Cafe Clatch the Cafe Clash Dust Cafe is what we call it, what? Is 1205 First Street Southwest. So it's on the corner of First Street and 12th Avenue. We're sandwiched between Home and Away and Leopold's Tavern. We're right across from Anytime Fitness and the Hotel Arts. Uh, and we can be found on Twitter at Cafe YYC, but that's spelled dramatically, so it's K A F F E E Y Y C. Twitter, it's the same um, username, so again, that's K A F F E E Y Y C. And then Facebook, I think you can find us using the same search term or the full name. Yeah. Um, and we are open weekdays from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We are open Saturdays from 9 to 8 p.m. And then, oh, we should back up. We have cocktail clash at 8 p.m. on Saturdays, but we also usually have live acts on Fridays at 7 p.m. And then Sundays, we are open from 9 to 5. But then we have Controller Club, which I believe other people will explain. Uh, <laughs> and that is our operating hours, our sketch of our events, and our social media, and our location. All the things. I am Jessica McCarroll, the owner slash founder slash worker at <laughs> Cafe Clutch. Thank you so much. I also do events at Cafe Clutch. I'm going to be doing interviews of almost everyone who performs at Cafe Clutch as much as I can get. I know people are, some people are shy, but we want to make sure that this becomes like a media hub for people to show up and if they're performing, we can give them an outlet to be interviewed because we need to fill that gap that Fast Forward kind of left. If no one knows what Fast Forward is, is it's a magazine that people would find events and shows and there would be interviews of all these local events that, that doesn't really exist here in Calgary anymore. So there's this gap that we need to fill and we're trying to fill that up. And I, I wanted to do this a long time ago, but Jess brought up the idea. This was her whole idea of maybe doing interviews, maybe doing something live so that people can understand this venue a little bit more. So um, I also do the events at Cafe Clutch too. So if you want to email me, jhnnai at gmail.com, I will definitely figure out an event for you, or you can just email me or message me right away on Instagram. We're very active on Instagram, especially even the Cafe Clutch Instagram is very, very, very active. So please, um, if you need an event or anything, just let me know. Um, and yes, you're going to see a lot of this on the website, on my website, <laughs> Den Modest Kids, right now dot wordpress.com and once I get money it'll just be demodifkids.com <laughs> so thank you everybody and we are done for today Mwah. that was like an hour an hour and ten minutes <laughs>